Starting a shoe business may not be that big of a deal, but achieving the status that Nike has achieved till today, for which we can safely say that the Nike swoosh looms large over the footwear industry, is surely an amalgamation of struggle, hard work, intelligence, marketing, and perseverance. The timeline for the creation of transforming Nike into what it is today follows the life of an ordinary man, who despite his tough conditions, revolutionized American entrepreneurship and set up a $100 billion sportswear giant. But how did Nike come into being, and what is the secret of it becoming an uncontested giant in the field? Is it the high-profile endorsements or its sleek designs, or is it the PR campaigns that made it successful enough to etch its way into pop culture history? There have been many brands that became successful as a brand themselves following the success of their products one after the other, but for Nike, the story's limelight is its creator and co-founder, Knight Phil. It is hard to talk about Nike and not talk about him. Welcome back. You are watching your favorite YouTube channel Big Brands. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the creation and success of a footwear masterpiece, the ever-remaining brand of sportswear, Nike. To understand it better, I have decided to take you on a journey that begins with a self-described average track runner coming out of college and a coach obsessed with the connection between speed, design, and comfort. So, are you ready to unveil the struggles and story behind the creation of Nike? But before that, Please make sure you have subscribed to my channel and hit the bell icon because only in this way can you know the story of major giants in several fields. With that being said, let's get into the video. The story roots back to the creation of Blue Ribbon Sports back in 1964. Phil Knight, around that time, went through the University of Oregon and did his MBA from Stanford, and in many ways, his experiences in these intuitions set his path in a way that he took himself from no one to become the co-founder of Nike. But what happened during these times wasn't so surreal or extraordinary, but the crazy idea of his being empowered by his mentor set him apart from others. During his time at the University of Oregon, he ran for the school's track and field team, and that is how he came into contact with Bill Bowerman, who was their coach at that time and later became the co-founder of his company. Apart from being a good coach and a competitive personality Bill Bowerman had an eye for sportswear, especially shoes. In fact, his fascination for sports shoes lured him into tinkering with several brand models with the help of local cobblers, and that in the future proved a millionaire-making habit for him. He used to gift his specially optimized shoes to his closer ones to try them on during a run. Though Phil had a great mind, he wasn't a great runner, and Bill considering him an unimportant runner to test his shoes on offered to take one of his shoes and customize them according to his design. Fortunately for him, Knight accepted the offer, and according to Nike, the customized shoes turned out so well that his teammate Otis Davis took them to run for the 400-meter dash in the 1960 Olympics and ended up winning a gold medal. During his time at Stanford, in one of his business classes, he wrote a paper theorizing that the production of running shoes should move from its current center in Germany to Japan, where labor was cheaper. Writing this down, he became ambitious to actually bring Japanese shoes to the US, and he became obsessed with selling cheaper shoes but with qualities similar to Adidas and Puma which were the major sportswear brand at that time. But he was really underexperienced in the department, as buying the shoes, in this case, didn't mean going to a shopping hall to the nearest store but importing them from over the seas. Still this lack of experience and the newness of his idea only assured him of what an incredible opportunity he had landed on, but he also knew that nothing could be achieved unless he had established a connection with a Japanese shoemaker and designer, and that couldn't be accomplished before visiting Japan. Therefore, to give practical shape to his idea, he went to Japan as a tourist, a tourist, who despite exploring mountains and culture, sought to look for shoe stores. In November 1962, while traveling through Japan in the city of Kobe, he stumbled upon Onitsuka Tiger, where he found shoes that matched his outlook for quality and design and liked them so much that he struck a deal with them to import their shoes to the US and he did this with sheer confidence and with no company whatsoever to his name in his country. Nevertheless, he received his first shipment of 12 pairs of Tiger shoes in 1963 and started selling them out of the back of his car at every running track he could drive. As you can imagine, the business wasn't scaling that much, and he soon realized that he needed another shoemaking mind. And he could think of no other than his coach Bill Bowerman from the University of Oregon. Fortunately, he wasn't that hard to find. He was quite popular in America at the time for having trained multiple Olympic athletes. And above all, he liked the Tiger shoes so much that he wanted to partner up because he was of the view that German shoes, though the best on the market, weren't anything too special to be replicated or even improved. This common interest led them to sign a 50-50 partnership in their new company, Blue Ribbon Sports, established in Eugene, 
Oregon, on January 25, 1964. They both invested $500 in it. They spent this initial investment on their first order, in which they bought 300 pairs at around $3.33 each. The shipment came through in April 1964 and, owing to Bill's connections, was sold out by July. In their first year, they sold $8,000 worth of shoes, and with that money, they started hiring salesmen for the company. In 1965 their revenue had increased to $20,000, and pretty soon, they opened their very own store in Santa Monica. Phil was handling the business side of the operation, while Bill was responsible for designs and bringing the actual innovation, and it is safe to say that it is this guy who single-handedly brought jogging to America. And when it comes to innovation, he was effectively designing on Onitsuka's shoes for them. With every new shipment, he'd cut open a few shoes to see how they were made and see how they could be improved by adding to the cushion or using more lightweight materials. And above all, he'd constantly sent his notes to Japan requesting changes. Then in 1965, the ever-innovative Bowerman proposed a new shoe design to the Tiger Shoe Company, the design which sought to provide the right support for runners with a cushioned inner sole, soft sponge rubber in the forefoot and top of the heel, hard sponge rubber in the middle of the heel, and a firm rubber outsole, the Cortez. It immediately became one of the best-selling shoes in 1968, undoubtedly thanks to the 1968 Olympics held in Mexico. And it was due to this model that BRS sold $300,000 worth of shoes in 1969. But the Cortez was so successful that soon they couldn't keep up with the demand. Every new shipment they received would sell faster than the one before, but Onitsuka kept the same pace as they were actually first satisfying their locals in Japan, and then what was left, they would send to America. But sooner than later, they realized that in order to grow and become world famous, they needed more than just a distributor and that the Cortez was Bowerman's design so that they have all the rights to start their own production as soon as their contract expires. And luckily for them, their contract would end in 1972, just before the Olympics in Munich. They had plenty of time till then. During that time, BRS said a controversial goodbye to the Japanese brand. In 1971 Phil started working on the branding of his own company. His first employee suggested calling the brand Nike, after the Greek goddess of victory. Then, Phil needed a logo, and what is very interesting to know here is that he went to a nearby university and snatched the first graphic. And for a minute sum of $35, Nike got its famous swoosh. Phil was now ready for the Olympics. This time, instead of signing a major deal with one contractor, he established a network of subcontractors across Japan. With production under his control, Phil could finally spread his wings, and on their own, we could only see Nike climbing the graphs of growth, production, revenue, and fame. After Cortez came to the waffle sole design, which was invented on a breakfast table. The story goes like. While thinking over breakfast on the way to give running shoes more traction, Bill saw the grooves in the waffle his wife made him and wondered what it would look inverted. Not one to pass on an idea, Bowerman poured melted urethane into his waffle iron. Unfortunately, he forgot to add any anti-stick agent onto the iron, and it glued shut. But nevertheless, the idea had taken root, and with the help of another waffle iron and presumably a good spray, he designed his ideal sole, and the iconic waffle trainer was born. And finally, by 1989, it became the largest sportswear company in America. From there on, marketing was one of the major keynotes that they accomplished in the form of brilliant campaigns like Just Do It, and by signing rookie athletes like Tiger Woods, Kobe Bryant, and LeBron James, they would eventually become famous across the world. The most lucrative of all the endorsements that surely proved a smash hit for Nike was with Michael Jordan. Despite having never worn a pair of Nikes before and hoping to sign a deal with Adidas, Jordan ended up signing on with Nike after a meeting in which they promised the soon-to-be star $500,000 a year for five years, two die-cast Mercedes cars, and shoes customized to his specific requests. To their utmost success, Jordan quickly rose to superstardom and his shoe line, Air Jordans, hit the market to make over $100 million in revenue by the end of 1985. Air Jordans continue to be a cash cow for Nike. Jordan continues to make roughly $100 million a year in Nike royalties alone. In 2004 the same year when Nike acquired Converse for $309 million, Phil Knight stepped down as CEO and president of Nike, and William Perez became the company's new CEO. He, however, still remains the chairman of the company. Today has become a statement for various celebs, from Bella Hadid to Jennifer Lopez and Kylie Jenner. Moreover, from Ronaldo to Kylian Mbappé, Nike is always associated with some of the biggest names in football. So, with this, we come to the end of our journey of Nike into making. I hope you liked the video, 
please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell icon on your way out. This will only take a split second but surely pump the YouTube algorithm to bring our videos to the top. See you in the next video.